so case 4 agar in a very common scenario a 12 year old male child presented with history of fever for past 3 days and pain abdomen and bleeding from gums and hematuria for one day and difficulty in breathing for past 2 hours on examination the child appears to be little puffy there is periorbital puffiness facial puffiness is there he is tachycardic uh, heart rate is around 130 per minute respiratory rate is 30 per minute which is again higher for his age group bp is slightly on the lower side it is 88 by 70 air entry on auscultation is reduced on the right side now what 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 are the differentials for this case and what should be the line of management so you may have to change your line of thinking from uh, metabolic cause to the injury to trauma to poisoning now we are moving on with the child who is presenting with fever so we have already have answers in the chat box dengue hemorrhagic fever dengue with pleural effusion moderate dengue 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 with warning signs viral hemorrhagic fever is another differential diagnosis and another uh, option given is hemolytic uremic syndrome uh okay any other uh, any other what are the usual differential diagnosis of dengue think of them they are more common not scurvy scurvy 12 year old child fever pain abdomen uh scurvy doesn't present like this scrub typhus okay what are the as i am giving you a clue differentials of uh dengue yes rickettsial what else common differentials of dengue most common in our country related to mosquito bite yes malaria enteric fever why not malaria enteric fever lepto so these are the uh, common uh, okay okay now you got it uh, i wanted malaria and enteric fever first after dengue rather than the other differential diagnosis so you have correctly pointed out could be dengue malaria enteric leptospirosis rickettsia uh, all these are uh, possible Uh, again i i think uh, dr vikram we want to ask something or we go on to ask them what is the line of management the yeah, only thing i want to uh, emphasize here is that you should uh, what what is there if for us it is a fever and there is evidence of bleeding what sort of bleeding is it dic or uh, is it thrombocytopenia suggestive bleeding it is mucosal bleeding is bleeding from gums and there is bleeding from uh, renal tract so it is a mucosal bleeding suggestive of thrombocytopenia there is air entry decrease on the right side right it is suggestive of fluid collection which is capillary leak so you are getting fever you are getting thrombocytopenia you are getting capillary leak now you can narrow down your differential fever with thrombocytopenia what are the common differentials we are dengue enteric malaria leptospirosis rickettsia these are your common differentials right so that that is how you should approach that is how you should write your differentials when the first patient arrive now line of management are uh, this patient is tachycardic and his bp is low so obviously the first thing is you have to manage the shock in this patient a b c airway and breathing is okay circulation we come down to circulation circulation is affected so that is the first thing we need to do so right uh, dengue will be my first differential in this case uh you mentioned about shock dr vikram i like to ask the students what kind of shock is there in dengue uh fever dengue hemorrhage what kind of dengue uh, shock is there in dengue it is important to know that because of the for the management it is hypovolemia 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 hypo why does hypovolemia occur why does hypovolemia occur it is not simple hypovolemia that there is no loss of volume the volume is still there in the body but it goes somewhere else capillary leakage goes to third spacing capillary leak so it's a kind of that means the distribution of the fluids is inappropriate and fluid is leaking from the vascular uh, bed to somewhere else so you are absolutely right that these this is a kind of distributive shock and uh, where the fluid or the uh, that manifests as hypovolemia in the fluid space dr vikram would like to elaborate yes absolutely right most common variety of shock seen in dengue is hypovolemic shock because of the capillary leakage so the fluid is leaking out into the third space so there is relative hypovolemia there is less fluid inside the blood vessels right so hypovolemic shock but there can be other kind of shocks in dengue as well shock in dengue can be multifactorial there can be cardiogenic shock dengue itself can lead to myocarditis so there can be cardiogenic shock 
there can be a septic shock like presentation dengue can lead to sometimes cytokine storm like picture so there can be septic shock suppose if there is massive pleural or massive pericardial effusion then they can lead to obstructive shock so all four kind of shocks hypovolemic shock distributive shock cardiogenic shock and obstructive shock are a possibility however most of the time you will get a hypovolemic kind of shock where there is massive capillary leakage so dr vikram if you are <coughs> saying as you are saying i correctly guessed it that all four kinds of shock is possible so do we try to differentiate between the various kind of shock at the beginning or we simply presume that this is a distributive shock and we start with fluid resuscitation always in a child with dengue shock so all most of these shocks even in septic shock and in the hypovolemic shock the main uh, goal is to give adequate fluid to the patient you, only in the cardiogenic shock but there is also it's not that dengue patient will only be having cardiogenic shock there will always be accompanied hypovolemic and a distributive shock uh, phenomena associated so you can always start with your fluid management and if the patient is not showing uh, expected improvement or the patient is deteriorating then you can look for the other cause like whether there is associated severe pericardial effusion is also there and you need to remove that pericardial fluid but initially you can right away start with your fluid management and it will definitely lead to some amount of improvement in the patient's condition uh, dr himmat has very rightly pointed out that the most common cause of death is fluid overload now most of the patient don't die when there is in shock because you always start in fluid but remember this fluid all the fluid remains inside the body only so whenever you are pumping this fluid the fluid which has gone into third space when the child starts improving that fluid will also come back to the vascular space and then there will be a manifestation of fluid overload so it is very important to guess when to stop the fluid infusion and that means you have to be very clear at what point of time the capillary leakage has stopped so there is no indication of giving further fluid because after that the fluid will come back to the vascular space rather than leaking from there uh, uh, dr vikram your yes. so yes so th- there are challenges in pa- managing a patient of dengue shock so first uh, it is very difficult to estimate their right fluid status these patients appear puffy so looks like they are in a fluid overloaded state even dengue can involve directly liver can cause dengue hepatitis so liver appears to be enlarged so it appears at the outset that patient may be fluid overloaded but may actually they will be uh, underfilled so that is one thing then secondly as i already pointed out there can be multifactorial etiology of shock so you are not dealing just one kind of shock third thing as sir has pointed out it's a dynamic course of illness the different phases of illness you have to take account those different phases so initially patient may be capillary leakage so you have to push more fluids but as the patient is recovering that fluid is going back into the circulation so that will lead to fluid overload and if you have not stopped your fluid and you have not taken enough measures to remove that fluid from the circulation then the patient may die of fluid overload so these are the things and second uh, one more important thing is majority of these patients are severely thrombocytopenic 10000 platelet 15000 platelet so that preclude the central line placement you cannot put central line placement which is a gold standard to measure the intravascular volume so how how do we go about it clinically you are not getting any clue whether the patient is hypervolemic or hypovolemic you are not able to put central line multifactorial etiology of shock is there and illness is changing uh, by hours so the very dynamic course of illness so how to go about it but we do have some tools uh, to to manage these patients and i would ask students if they can uh, reply uh dr vikram i am just reminded of my trip to uh, sri lanka around i think it was around 5 years back and i happened to visit their dengue ward and because i was told that the mortality from dengue was still prevalent there but the mortality from dengue was almost nil the only thing they did was that uh, equip every bed dengue bed with an ultrasonographic and ultrasonographic uh, machine for ultrasonography so how does ust help in the management of uh, dengue i like to know from the students how does what is the role of ultrasonograph in the management of such cases you can bed side eco let's let's talk of usg simple usg you can see the ivc collapse what else yes one can see ivc collapsibility um 
IV, what else other than IVC collapsibility? You can you can localize and quantify pleural effusion. Yes, fluid anywhere. So the, as I said, it is important to time the leak because when the leak starts, a leak doesn't persist for more than 48 to 72 hours. So if you can time the leak, uh, the start of time of leak, you can also predict the time of stopping of leak. So that means after that, there is no point in infusing further fluids because that will only lead to fluid overload and you have to look for other causes of shock if present. So uh, yeah, Dr. Vikram, over to you. How USG can help? Most of the answers have been given by the students. Right, so uh, USG ultrasonography has just changed the dynamics of managing dengue patient. It is a boon uh, in the PICU if you have a bedside USG available to you. Uh, rightly said, uh, you can see IVC collapsibility. So, uh, intra, uh, inferior vena cava collapsibility, it's an uh, indirect marker to your fluid status. So, if it is collapsible, it is more than 50% collapsible, it means that your patient is fluid responsive. If it is distended, it is not collapsing at all. It means that there is enough fluid in the system, you don't need to push more fluid into the patient. So, that is one thing. Secondly, as Sir has pointed out, uh, we can uh, use the ultrasound to just mark uh, uh, quantity of uh, fluid in the pleural cavity, in the pericardial cavity. So we will know whether there is uh, ongoing capillary leakage and we can use it to quantify on a hourly or a daily basis. That yesterday the pleural effusion was 5 cm, now it has become 10 cm. So the patient is having ongoing capillary leakage. And bedside uh, ultrasonography can also be used to see cardiac contractility. So you can uh, calculate the ejection fraction and you can know whether your heart is pumping enough. So you will know uh, uh, whether cardiogenic component is also there to the shock or not and decide accordingly. So all those facilities uh, where the ultrasound sonography bedside USG is not available, we will strongly, I will strongly advocate that they should invest in this because this is highly, highly cost effective. Uh, almost it is similar to having a pulse oximeter uh, in a case of uh, COVID. So here also the bedside ultrasonography is very important in managing uh, a case of, if it is not there, then there are certain other markers which Dr. Vikram will, uh, you have already pointed out heart rate, respiratory rate, liver size, uh, crepitation, hematocrit, etc. by which you can gauge, but um, it will be uh, it'll excellent and a gold standard that a bedside USG is already there. Now again, coming back to the same question, once again, what are the common errors that uh, the residents commit when managing a child with dengue? Most common error is uh, giving fluids when without monitoring a patient. See, uh, guidelines, uh, people say that the so guidelines say 10 ml per kg for 2 hours, then 5 ml per kg, then 7 ml per kg. These guidelines are very broad. You have to individualize the treatment. You have to keep monitoring the patient either through ultrasonography or clinically or on the basis of metocrit. And you have to keep in mind that illness is very dynamic. Right, scapillary leakage may last for 24 hours in one patient, 48 hours in another patient, and may last for 72 hours in another patient. You not broadly give uh, direction to the nurses that give so much amount of fluid for next 24 hours. You have to monitor which phase your patient is in. And if the capillary leakage has stopped, then you also have to taper down on your fluid therapy. Fluid therapy is the only thing available for dengue. If it, if it is done right, then most likely you will get very good outcome in your dengue patients. So these are the two things, not giving fluid blindly, not keeping in mind the dynamic nature of the illness. If you keep that fact in your mind that uh, the patients can anytime come back to its normalcy and the fluid can come back again to the circulation, then more often than not, you will not uh, miss this fluid overload kind of condition, which, which is actually deleterious and can actually kill the patient. The only key to successful management of a dengue patient is a continuous clinical monitoring. So if you are monitoring clearly and there will definitely be clues, a child with dengue will not die without giving you any warning signs. There will definitely be clues of what is happening and you can take uh, adequate investigation and management at a very good point of time. So uh, due to multi, what is the choice of inotropes uh, for shock? If it is a multiple etiology for shock, Dr. Vikram, there's a query from Dr. Giridhar. Right. So you can straight away start with dopamine, right? Uh, even in the latest guidelines, it is recommended that if the dengue patients are not recommended to the adequate fluid therapy, 
and if you have to have to uh, start an inotrope you can start with dopamine if it is a septic kind of shock patient is not responding to even to dopamine then norepinephrine should be added suppose this is a cardiac shock because of the myocarditis secondary to dengue then uh, then dobutamine should be added in uh, adjunct to the dopamine so both has to be the co-infusion has to be given in those circumstances okay when to intubate i think that's that's obvious the general uh, indications of intubation also apply here nothing uh, specific in dengue why there is itching during the recovery states uh, why there is itching during the recovery state i think we are coming to questions which are beyond the critical care with there are definite answers for this and uh, lft and serum albumin dr malikarjun has raised a query role of lft and serum albumin vikram so lfts are uh, can be deranged uh, there can be congestive hepatopathy dengue can directly cause hepatitis so lfts may be deranged in dengue so nothing specific has to be done for the uh, deranged lfts as the illness uh, improves then uh, lft also gradually improves uh, uh, regarding albumin uh, there is no uh, you can get dilute uh, albumin is not specifically get uh, uh, deranged in because it's not a chronic hepatitis kind of condition and uh, there is no direct effect on the albumin uh maybe she want to ask about colloid uh so that that is the, to be recommended if the patient has not responded to two boluses of ringer lactate or normal saline then third bolus can be tried of colloid and colloid do help because uh it will retain for more time in the intravascular compartment than the normal ringer lactate or the normal saline so that that can be given or for that matter even albumin can be given only factor is that it is it is costlier so we go for uh, other easily available colloids like dextran role of transfusion in hypotension if the patient is actively bleeding if the patient is actively bleeding and that uh, the, then 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 you can give a uh, whole blood cell transfusion to the patient otherwise no role of uh, empirical prophylactic uh, transfusions okay i think we go on to the next case uh, now So, myocardial dysfunction with dengue myocardial shock uh, sir said about dobutamine adding dobutamine to dopamine okay. so okay. The, this just platelet type of transfusion by and large platelet transfusion do not have do any not role do. in uh, that that is a very clear thing uh, dr vikram like to say about platelet transfusion i think that's a common pitfall we need to address this definitely uh, unless unless it, it, there is a severe bleeding severe bleeding means if there is intracranial bleed or the gross bleeding from any side for simple mucosal bleeding no platelet transfusion to be given until the platelet count is less than 20000 so no no not to be given some authorities okay. even say 10000 dr vikram uh, just coming to my mind what about the alternative therapies like goat's milk papaya <laughs> leaves uh, these are commonly used by the and i remember in the last uh, season of dengue the goat milk was selling around 500 rupees a kg so, so they don't have to, yeah these are not evidence based practices and okay. see viral illnesses they they just improve by themselves you have to give supportive management so you give anything majority of the patient will show some response and that therapy will become first line therapy so, so we don't have any strong evidence to support uh, the yeah. practices yeah you you are showing us a ultrasonography doctor this is the ultrasonography of the same patient which was already received three boluses right so uh, the common mentality is that we have pushed enough fluid and now the patient does not require enough fluid so when we did the ultrasonography at the bed side then we see that ivc was still collapsible so we pushed more fluid so that that, that is how ultrasound can uh, you can see this uh, if you can see my pointer this is the heart so this is the right atrium you are seeing and this this is the ivc this this above thing is liver so this is the ivc traversing the liver and going into the right atrium and you can see this is almost a kissing ivc the both the surfaces are touching to each other so it's a completely collapsible which suggests that this patient is fluid responsive and you can post more fluid into this patient excellent excellent i i i, I really love that uh, that video of ultrasound thank you vikram for showing it to all of